So a cement has a relationship with Cornell, what, 50 years, 60 years, Ronnie? Even I'm getting close to that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I studied in yeah. cement, so yeah, about as long as cement's been going. Yeah, so I mean, we go back to 43, you don't go back that far, I think, uh, to our origins, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation program in Mexico. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is in our gene bank, that's maize. Those are very uh, heterogeneous populations. Maize, you know, is very promiscuous, and it's, so it's every seed, or many of the seeds are quite different. Uh, so from the gene bank to the farmer's field, that's going to be the topic today, how we're We've had this tremendous treasure of seed at Simit for decades, and, but we've been only able to tap a small amount of diversity in that. We really didn't have the tools, didn't know what was there. We just knew it was valuable, but we didn't know how to tap it. And, and now the, the tools are coming in place and you know them very well here. So I'm gonna talk about our relationship uh, and I hope it will flourish even further. Um, a long-term partnership in plant breeding. <coughs> Got people like Mark and Ronnie. Long history at Simit. Ken Sayer in agronomy and uh, Andy McDonald. I don't know if some of you know him. One of our youngest generation uh, agronomists. And we've got other agronomists here in the room. Um, Matthew Reynolds was a student here and one of our physiologists. And Ravi Singh, uh, our lead plant, uh, wheat breeder. Simit is very indebted to some of the science that's been developed here, uh, especially Barbara McClintock, a graduate student here and a faculty member. And we're very grateful for all the support over the years that Ronnie has made in bringing us together as two institutions. Uh, Borlaug's only graduate student, I'm told, and uh, many distinguished awards. Probably many more yet to come. Now, one of his greatest achievements, uh, and Cornell's and Simmet's greatest achievements, is this global Borlaug Global Rust Initiative that Norman Borlaug pleaded for uh, in the end of his days, uh, near the end, and it came about in 2008, jointly funded by Bill and Melinda Gates and DFID, with a global range of partners. And it's been quite successful. We have stem rust, UG99 resistant germplasm being deployed all over the threatened parts of the world to hopefully build a barrier against its movement out of East Africa, especially into South Asia. And we've got the slow rusting genes in place now that should give us uh, some real durable resistance. Okay, one of our newest projects, which we're very excited about, is the new Feed the Future Innovation Lab. It's a $5 million project, climate resilient wheat, with Kansas State, Simit, and Cornell. Field evaluations will take place in the Borlaug Institute for South Asia. Anyone heard of that before? Okay, that's a new subsidiary institute of Simit. We think South Asia has the capacity to develop a lot of the science like we do in, in Mexico. And we're trying to build up a, a sister subsidiary there. And I have, there's a little information up here. If, if you're interested, you can find it on the website. But the government of India has given us uh, 1,200 acres. Uh, Pakistan has given us land, Nepal, Bangladesh we've talked about. Uh, this project will focus on genomic selection uh, for the warmer climates, for climate change that's coming there. Ronnie tells me it's Climate shifted about a month here, winter, uh, before winter hits hard here, and it's starting to happen in South Asia. Although people are talking about a 10 or 20 year lag phase that may happen with climate change before we get a next big uh, temperature spike. Tom, people in here will remember Jesse Holman, who's the Kansas State leader of this project. Yes. He's a grad student. Right. Uh, you have some graduate students here who are involved in um, Simit, and uh, we would like many more graduate students from Cornell to do their research with us, get your degree from here. Uh, we have graduate students from all over the world, including from Iran, working on uh, projects in Simit. This is a, a drought tolerant um, wheat project. 
in, in, uh, in, that was near Isfahan. Um, Roberto Romero is working on genome-wide association flowering time loci in our Seeds of Discovery maze panel. I hope you may have heard of Seeds of Discovery. If you haven't, please Google that. And that's a $10 million a year project funded by the Mexican government for us to geno genotype and phenotype our seed, our gene banks. And it's been successful uh, so far in, in looking at um, the hits on chromosome eight. I think this is uh, flowering. I forget right at the moment. Um, what? Yep. Yep. Uh, we're also participating today in this uh, event. I'm happy to be here. Um, I would also like to mention that we're having an event on Borlaug's 100th birthday anniversary at Obregón in Mexico, uh, uh, March 25th. And we'll have some very prominent people there as speakers. And I hope you will, I hope many of you could join us. It'll be quite, a, quite an amazing event. Okay, uh, further with my presentation, Simmet's germplasm collections, new varieties, two new varieties in the farmer's fields. So here's the, kind of, here's the pathway we're taking. We've got the gene banks. Uh, we've got amazing diversity in those gene banks. Uh, over 27,000 accessions of land races, of maize, for example. So what does the gene bank do? It, we collect, we even collect Teosinte. We data management, database management, distribution, seed processing, germination, testing, storage, characterization, regeneration, and we safely back it up. For, for example, here at Salzburg, at the uh, Doomsday Gene Bank, as we, <laughs> as they call it. We have an impressive uh, collections of maize and wheat, more than 27, nearly 28,000 maize, nearly 140,000 wheat accessions. Uh, this is the rate that we're bringing new ones in. Uh, this is the rate that we're distributing them out. And, uh, and externally, this is internal distribution, and this is external distribution. So there's very few institutions today that are doing this kind of distribution. A lot of countries have basically, like India has just pretty much locked it up to a snail's pace. China has also been quite a problem. Uh, so this is one of the few places where if you need germplasm, you can come shopping. Uh, we are also, our gene bank is one of the uh, only uh, ISO certified gene banks in North America. Our wheat collection, uh, genotyping, uh, evaluation of more than 50,000 accessions. Uh, we, we're using PDAs and, I mean, you do all this here, of course, but uh, for the developing world, this is a little bit out there. Uh, the Seeds of Discovery data capture software is used. DNA samples have been prepared so far of 32,000 accessions and uh, DNA sample preparation for more than 60,000 accessions for heat and drought. And this is the, the two big traits we're focusing on at present. In maize, we've got uh, more than 4,000 test crosses uh, between the core land race accessions and testers. Test cross progeny evaluated in nine locations across Mexico. DNA extracted from the land race parents and a simple tracking system. Uh, current projects, specialty land race maize for the pozole, the blue and the red, and genetic fingerprinting of the CMLs, uh, our inbred lines. You're, most of you have probably seen this sl slide. It's been repeatedly shown in many fora. It's not Simmets. But it gives you a sense of what is happening with uh, maize and wheat, the rate of gain of yields uh, worldwide. We were on a, a really nice track in the Green Revolution, seeing a little flattening, especially for wheat. That is bringing us down below demand. Uh, we can push that yield up with agronomy and breeding, but it's being pushed down, meanwhile, by diseases, uh, water scarcity, nutrient energy scarcity, climate change. 
So this is the struggle. How are we going to push it up under worsening conditions? More than 350 million people are living on food from water that is disappearing in, in, from the ground. It's going to disappear. Um, soils that are becoming saline. Uh, many problems are emerging, running out of arable land. So addressing that, we've got our gene bank. We've got seeds of discovery to facilitate wider use of the, of the resources. Uh, here's how it works, the seeds of discovery. We have a lot of partners uh, all around the world. We really, Cement does not try to do it all. We want the most efficient, cost-effective provider to do it. We need people that understand what needs to be done and maybe do some of the proof of concept work, but then we want to farm it out to the most efficient provider uh, globally. This is contrary to other institutions that want to, are more possessive about things. So we start with our, our gene bank. We do the genotyping and phenotyping. We look for the traits, the genetic makeup, plug it into integration pipeline, then plug it into the breeding programs and out comes the breeding material. So understanding where the traits are, the alleles are, is we finally have the power to do that and ev with ever increasing precision and, and efficiency. We're also working on molecular uh, atlas uh, for maize, taking accessions, one DNA sample each, 30 plants, and coming out. We've got 40,000 land race accessions uh, populations because there's so much diversity within every container. Uh, we've got 16,000 accessions genotyped to date. Uh, we're putting the uh, profiles together, getting the allele frequency, getting the genetic relationships, and coming up with a molecular atlas for maize. Uh, similarly for wheat, uh, we have a little different approach, taking the gene bank accessions, doing a phase one phenotyping, taking an individual, taking a leaf sample, getting the DNA from there, taking a seed sample, um, association, accession derivatives, phase two genotyping, genotype seed repository, and pre-breeding. And we've got a target of 120,000 accessions and so far we've got 40,000 uh, done to date. Here's the major traits that we're looking at. We can't do everything. I mean, we're just, just doing some, I mean, very minuscule sampling at this point, and then hopefully the power will allow us to do much more uh, diversity of traits. But heat and drought are important for, for both crops. Then we get into phosphorus efficiency, diseases, quality, uh, diseases, lodging, and quality. This is an area that's really helping our physiology. I'm sure you're doing it here also, um, using this, the blimps and the, uh, the unmanned aerial vehicles, fast, non-destructive, avoids temporal variation, and higher spatial resolution than satellite imagery. We've got, if you track the ground-based measurements with the aerial measurements, we get a, a fairly linear uh, line with those. Not always perfect, but uh, we're finding that the aerial measurements are better than the ground-based measurements, are closer to the reality of the, of the accession. So in the wheat program, uh, going into the breeding program, we've got seeds of discovery for the wider use. Uh, here's where wheat is grown around the world. Uh, the most important wheat producing country is China, number one. Second most important is India. Uh, we're heavily focused here. We're heavily focused in this area. Uh, we're, we're focused, trying to get more focus here. Unfortunately, uh, although Africans import $4 billion worth of maize, or excuse me, $12 billion worth of wheat every year, uh, Donor agencies think wheat's not important in Africa. They would rather let Africans spend their hard-earned money importing wheat and rice instead of producing it themselves. And we, this is a problem we've got with the donors. They need to, there is, there are 
There are even small holders, I mean, very big in Ethiopia, somewhat in Kenya and other parts of As Africa. But this whole area here could be, could be a very good wheat producing area. And definitely there's some sociological uh, issues, economic issues that have to be taken care of, uh, but it can be done. And we, we're re that's one of the areas we're pushing at. We would like to do more in South America, but the South Americans have not been supporting very many of the centers, unfortunately. Um, and of course, a lot of our germplasm goes here. Um, in fact, you know, here's the distribution of our germplasm, 620 cooperators worldwide. Um, I wish all of them were very reliable in reporting back their results. Um, unfortunately, it's less than 50%, but uh, even that is, per is developing a massive database. It goes back, uh, I think, more than 50 years that we can mine that data. It, it, there's some incredible understandings that could come out if we would put all that data together and start mining it uh, for phenotypic uh, response. Uh, our wheat focuses on mega programs. We've selected areas of similar uh, conditions. For example, these areas are similar. Uh, red areas are similar. And uh, so we breed for those different colors, the conditions under those different colors with wheat. And those different mega environments have these primary traits that we're breeding for, uh, mostly, mostly diseases at this time, but heat and, and drought uh, are coming ever more important. Also, uh, we're funded to do zinc and iron. So breeding must integrate multiple traits for developing successful varieties. So core traits, high and stable yield, durable resistance to stem rust, we want yellow rust, stripe rust, all of these. Water use efficiency, this is ever more uh, important, uh, especially in northern India, northern Pakistan, the Yellow River Plain, all through the Middle East, Ogawala Aquifer in the US, we, we have to move heavily in that direction. Uh, conventional breeding for uh, grain quality, uh, for grain yield. This, this bothers me a little bit. Um, this is what's happened since 51 to 2011. Okay, a, a straight line has been drawn here, but I'm a little more skeptical of that line. I see a line going this way, and I see a line going this way. And maybe part of this, the, re the, the reason for this line going this way is low commodity prices during the 80s and 90s. But it's still, you know, we've gotten higher prices and maybe we're starting to move back up there. But what we're seeing, the yield increases per hectare, it's simple interest, it's not compound interest. We should be getting 1% more of our new, newest high yielding variety, not 1% more of our, of our old, uh, you know, varieties. So, Wheat is falling behind. Something needs to be done to supercharge wheat here. Now, could that be hybrid wheat? Could that be improved photosynthetic efficiency? Could it be the drought tolerance and heat tolerance? Could it be nitrogen use efficiency? Uh, all or many of those stacked together, but something has to be done. We're heading to a bit of a train wreck uh, here. Uh, shuttle breeding, this has been so, so important for Simmet's success. And Norman Borlaug started this shuttle breeding between El Baton and Toluca and Obregón. And this is, where, this is where the Borlaug event, where our big wheat station, where Norm's Borlaug's famous uh, station was. So we get this high altitude relative to the humid area, we get good disease uh, conditions. So we can test our wheats for disease. Up here, we can get really high yields, and we get two generations a year. And that was quite amazing at the time. And it also made wheat photoperiod insensitive in the process, which made it more adaptable around the world. Now, we're added a new location to shuttle breeding. We're taking material out to Kenya, where there's even more very extreme disease pressure and other pressures. And we're finding that is, is helping us to generate uh, better varieties. Uh, if we look at the physiological approach to our strategy on drought uh, of wheat, we're, this is one of the areas we, uh, water use, our 
water use efficiency, photo protection with, with pigments and, uh, and leaf wax, partitioning, does it go to the spike or does it go to the roots, uh, water uptake, and here we're trying to make some progress. In fact, we're having a meeting next month in Canada where I hope we're gonna lock in the efficient uh, leaf photosynthesis, taking not C4, but some other more simple approaches to getting some gain in photosynthetic efficiency. The thing I like to frequently say is some of you, maybe not here in Cornell, but have solar panels on your roof. And maybe when you bought those, they were around 10% efficient. Uh, now Sanyo is selling some that are 22% efficient. Uh, in the laboratory, they've got some that are 40% efficient at converting sunlight to electricity. What's the efficiency of our wheat and our rice? One. One percent uh, of the solar energy that's hitting that field. We've got a photosynthetic system that's 350 million years old. It may be it could use some tweaking to, to boost its, maybe it'd be a little more fragile, but maybe under controlled conditions of a field, we can manage. Even if we got just 1.5%, think what about what that would do to the area that would need to be under wheat around the world. Could we reduce it by a third? Could we get a third more production? And if we could get to 2%, you know, sugarcane sometimes, I mean, it really covers the field for a long time. It can go 8%. Uh, Maize can go two to three percent with the C4 system. So that's, you know, we need to do this. We need a Manhattan project to break through on photosynthesis. If we can do it with solar photonic panels, why can't we do it, you know, with, with our plants? Okay, we're also, um, you know, the heat and drought for the moment, we, we've got a lot of power to be able to make changes there. Here's some QTLs, and these solid lines are the robust QTLs uh, under stress and, and irrigated conditions. So we've made some real progress in, in moving towards the markers that we'll be needing. Uh, we've got 70,000 wheat uh, sources um, that were screened in 2011 to 2013. I mean, that was quite a task, just it goes on forever, the, the plots that are out there. Uh, and that's, I'm, we're very grateful, that's, most of this is the Mexican government paying for this. Not the US government, not the European Union, the, the Mexican government has shown the, the vision. Um, new lines based on physiological traits. This is an approach that, that the wheat breeding program is taking, uh, and this check uh, that does well under drought conditions in taking a physiological approach instead of the traditional approach, they've been able to get uh, some much higher yielding varieties than the traditional approach. And likewise in water relations, um, having much quicker progress uh, instead of using the traditional approach. Okay, canopy temperature uh, shows consistent association with yield under drought and heat. You know that. Uh, we're using that uh, much more. We're reinvesting in our synthetic program. I, synthetic is an unfortunate word, I think. It's, they aren't synthetic wheats. They're, you know, wheat, bread wheat, has three genomes. Three fathers, three mothers. Um, Durham wheat has two fathers, two mothers. Goat grass somehow crossed with the Durham wheat and ended up with three mothers and three fathers. But very few of this, this happened very few times in ancient history, maybe four or five times. So there's a little diversity from this being brought into this. We've got thousands and thousands of accessions of Taoshai or goat grass. We have so much potential to bring in new diversity, um, and even from other uh, wild relatives of wheat, um, to bring in resistance to serum head uh, stripe, uh, septoria rust, hessian fly drought. So this is, we, we did this heavily in the 70s, and our material we're releasing now is from that program back then. 
and it's got 15% higher yield in many locations. And so it was uh, unfortunate that we s didn't continue that, but we are investing heavily now. And we're seeing that um, we're getting up to 30% increase. And in fact, the British are building a case for what they call their 2020 project based on this material. Uh, they're trying to get 20 tons per hectare by 2020. And if you read the, the write-ups on it, it's, it's Simmet's synthetic wheats um, that have, where new diversity has been brought in. And they're gonna add additional uh, traits uh, and alleles to, to improve those varieties. So uh, now let's switch to maize. We've been talking about wheat. Let's switch to maize and its global uh, and its breeding program. I think we're still doing okay. Um, here's where maize is grown. So maize is amazing. Maize is the green revolution crop of today. What's the number one crop in China? What do Chinese like to eat? Not maize. They like to eat meat, no. Uh, and so they're growing maize. Maize has passed rice and wheat as the number one crop. Demand grows 12% a year, production's only growing 10% a year and it's gonna start dropping off. Uh, they gotta get off some of the hilly regions down here where there's a lot of soil erosion. Um, India is far behind. They've got a vegetarian tradition uh, in India, so it's not producing the kind of maize. It's, I mean, maize is the number one crop in Mexico, in the US, and in China. But here it's, it's third. And because of that vegetarian tradition, maybe we should encourage them on that, encourage them to go into horticulture and, and vegetables and, and more pulses. But nobody wants to be told what they're gonna eat or not eat. And Bombay is already eating chicken at the world average. So whether they're the trend leader or not, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, but there's another way to do the numbers. You know, if you grow pulses, if you grow lentils, chickpeas, um, Erdahl, you, you're lucky if you get one and a half tons, two tons. I mean, in, in research trials, maybe you can get three tons, but farmers are usually getting less than one ton. Uh, you know, the, the efficiency of conversion of feed in poultry is, can reach two to one. Two kilos of feed, one kilo of poultry. And if you can produce five, seven, eight, ten tons of maize, and then you'll need some soybean also, that might be a more efficient way to get protein into, into the Indian diet. In eggs, I mean, vegetarians will often eat eggs. Uh, some vegetarians will eat fish. Uh, this, need, really need, this kind of computation needs to be looked at, that maybe maize should be invested in as a way to get more protein into the diet of the 40% of children in India who are stunted, 40%. They just launched a rocket to Mars. And, every, and so the donors, Gates Foundation, others just say, India doesn't need much help from us. But 40% of the children are stunted. And that, that has really got to end. And we've got to figure out ways to do that. We just grew maize on our Borlaug Institute site this last spring, during the hot season, March, April, May, temperatures go 40, 45 degrees sometimes, we use subterranean drip irrigation. Normally you don't want to grow maize during that season, there's just too much evaporation. But we use subterranean drip irrigation for half the water, we got 10, 11 tons per hectare. A huge return on the water investment. Uh, so I think using those kind of technologies, we could dramatically with the breeding and with the agronomy, we could get huge increases. Uh, probably our most successful project uh, is our drought tolerant maize for Africa. We're also working on waterlogging tolerance, which is a big problem, especially in Eastern India, Bangladesh, and heat tolerance. Um, started uh, screening for this, 1975, especially for drought, and now on uh, low nitrogen uh, tolerant germplasm. Um, so we're using Cornell's, let's test your attention here, um, 
gastric bypass surgery. Uh, <laughs> uh, is an integrated part of CIMIT's uh, maize molecular breeding effort. Uh, almost all CIMIT's elite lines are genotyped using this. High density uh, genotyping generates 500,000 polymorphic SNPs for only $30 per sample. This is so much cheaper than trying to do, do it in, in the field and understand what's going on. It's, it's become so much cheaper. And, and soon we'll be, we've got a new haploid facility. We've got haploids going on, tropical, subtropical haploids in Mexico, and now we've got a new facility in Africa, and that's going to help uh, further. Uh, this program is definitely integrated with you. I mean, just like Norman Borlaug's shuttle breeding, this is shuttle uh, with data uh, between Mexico, our sites in Africa, um, and Cornell, and using your platform to give us understanding of these traits. Uh, Maze is also using uh, the remote sensing, uh, the Skywalker system, for example, here in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is one of our best locations. You, you know, reading the newspapers, you think, oh my God, who would want to go to Zimbabwe? Or, our staff loves Zimbabwe. We can't get them to leave. Uh, more want to go there. Uh, we, ha we have a great relationship with the government, uh, full support, full diplomatic UN privileges. And now, you think they'd be a little paranoid about flying drones around their country. <laughs> <laughs> but we're doing it uh, for thermal and multispectral images. Uh, and it's, and so drought tolerant maize for Africa. This is our biggest success so far. Uh, we've got Gates Foundation, USAID, piling money on this to get the seed that we've developed over the years uh, out to uh, 13 sub-Saharan, uh, should be, or countries, uh, 30,000 tons produced in 2012. 110 seed companies have picked them up. Uh, 1.23 million hectares have been planted in these drought tolerant where you can get 40% yield where you would get nothing uh, with the old uh, material and benefiting about 3 million households. And so it's both OPVs and hybrids that are going out to these countries. Um, but right when everyone was just kumbaya and let's go celebrate, uh, a dark cloud as often happens with people who work on field uh, work came over the horizon. And, uh, but I'll get, let me get into that in just a minute. So here's how we get into this, how we made uh, progress, or making, currently making progress in drought stress phenotyping, profiling, uh, high throughput, semi-automated, non-destructive measurements, and getting automated weather stations, and using these tropically adapted inducer uh, haploid inducer elements. And this is really exciting. This is, this is going to have a huge effect on maize in uh, the tropics and subtropics. Um, but this is the dark cloud. Uh, maize lethal necrosis. We were producing all this drought tolerant seed, shipping it out, and lo and behold, we started seeing areas here that are now into three or four years of complete crop destruction. Um, there's been a, a virus in Africa that was there and didn't cause too much trouble, but apparently a second virus came in from Asia, either Southeast Asia or China, probably in some sweet corn shipments that don't go through quite the rigor. This is a disease, this maize lethal necrosis, it's shown up in Nebraska, it's shown up in Hawaii, but it fairly rapidly got suppressed with resistant material and, and good programs. But it's taken off here in Africa, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, into southern Sudan. And so we're throwing everything we can at this right now. We've had to destroy tons of, of seed, of drought tolerant maize seed. And uh, fortunately, 20% of our germplasm had the resistance. And so we've quickly started increasing, putting all efforts in increasing that. Now USAID wants us to ramp it up all over uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to get resistant material out there before this disease spreads uh, more widely. Uh, here's the symptoms of what you get from this pairing of 
of these two viruses, um, the necrosis. And uh, for one of the viruses, we've got um, good SNPs to, to locate. Uh, three SNP markers have been identified. Uh, and this increases, been able to use it to increase resistance by 25%. Uh, we also have a project funded by the Gates Foundation on nitrogen use efficiency with uh, Pioneer. And uh, again, good progress uh, there with the, the national programs with Pioneer, 70,000 rows of low end screening. I mean, Africa is only using about six or seven kilos per hectare of nitrogen. What are you using in Iowa? Is it 200 or 300, perhaps? I think China is frequently at 300 kilos per hectare. Um, so there, what little nitrogen fertilizer makes it out there, we've got to make sure it's used efficiently. And that's what this project's doing. Um, and the WEMA, the water use of, here's another program, the water use efficient uh, maze for Africa. Uh, the Mars populations are the largest resource in tropical maize uh, <coughs> available globally. Uh, it links WEMA and, and DTMA at uh, 100 lines now uh, and using the GBS and phenotyping data. So finally, you can't just produce varieties. Uh, we have a huge effort in helping small and medium-sized seed companies in Africa multiply this seed. It just, it's, it's really a struggle. In India, we have, and in South Asia, we've got a consortium uh, with, uh, I think, over 100 companies together, working together as a uh, pipeline to distribute seed. But it's, it's more of a struggle. And we also need the agronomy. And you're plant breeders, I guess, and so you're probably not interested in agronomy. Uh, but if I had time, we could talk about the Take It to the Farmer initiative in Mexico. That's nearly $20 million per year uh, working over a vast area of Mexico to deliver new varieties, conservation agriculture technology, uh, and even developing cell phone decision support tools. Uh, Seeds of Discovery is feeding into that program. We have in Asia we have the Crop and Systems Initiative for South Asia, run by Cornell Zone uh, Andy McDonald. Uh, in Africa we have the Simlesa, the Maize and, and Legumes Project, funded by Australia. Uh, and so we've got these three huge uh, cropping system initiatives that I wish you would look into. We also have the Borlaug Institute for South Asia. And we have many locations globally where you can phenotype material, globally. And so, and we can develop improved agronomic techniques. Uh, you can use us as a resource to go to the world. Um, so I, I strongly encourage you to do that. I mean, we could, start doing hybrid wheat together. Um, many, all the big companies have approached us and are pushing for this. Um, we can, as I said, work on the photosynthesis. Um, there's many, we can work on nitrification uh, inhibition uh, it's to keep the fertilizer from going back into the atmosphere. Um, we've, got, we've got small components of these projects underway, uh, but we need uh, more tech er, uh, intellectual horsepower uh, behind them. So thank you very much. We may even have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh,